Good morning, everyone. Please remain standing. The invocation this morning will be pronounced by Elder Douglas Chris Harder, the father of John Harder, a member of the graduating class. To the spirit that inspires us, to the natural forces that make us who we are, to the source of our dreams, to the mystery behind that we call intuition, to the elders and the heroines who've gone before, to our personal God, and to the God of our parents, and the God of our religious traditions, and to the God of our nation, who says we are all created equal. We invite you, come this day, and speak to us through everything that's said and done. We've learned that the rule of law is essential for our nation's survival. Our national tradition says we are a brotherhood, a sisterhood, siblings from sea to sea. Now help us sense that all humanity is one family, our family, one tribe, one nation from pole to pole. Wake us up to the power and justice of the golden rule, how essential it is for our survival and the worldwide family survival. And this tiny planet, help us perfect our humble home. Give us profound intuition. May that spirit, that God, that enlightenment fill us here this day. And take our natural ability and our acquired knowledge and move us to personal fulfillment and action. Meet the needs of each of us and our families in this great universe. Through this service we pray, amen. Please be seated. Members of the class of 2009, faculty and staff, distinguished guests and families, trustees, Gray, Monahan, and Hartwell, Trustee Emeritus Marion, friends of the university. We gather this morning in celebration, reflection upon the days that we have shared together, anticipation of what lies ahead, and relief that exams, grades, and tuition bills are finally behind you. Yet surely there is a suspicion lurking among some of you, a suspicion that it is best not to dwell on this morning, that there will be days ahead when you will find yourself wistfully looking back on torts and contracts and the friendly confines of Lewis Hall, when you will find yourselves marveling at how your professors actually made it all interesting and thinking that the quest for a good grade was so much more civilized than the quest for billable hours. Before we get too far into the formalities of the ceremony this, this morning, I have a request for the graduates. Reflect for just a moment before we get too carried away with the festivities on the significance of this day. You are not graduating just from law school. You are graduating from Washington and Lee's School of Law, a school known for its academic excellence, to be sure, but also for its humane approach. And as someone mentioned to me just a little while ago, its very warm environment. In that spirit, take note also of the people who have gathered here today, parents, spouses, partners, children, friends, faculty and staff, they couldn't be prouder. They have sacrificed on your behalf and you are surely filled with gratitude. But today is your day and our pride comes from knowing that someone we care about has, after much hard work, achieved a goal and fulfilled a dream. It is fitting that we take note of others who made this possible. This is the 160th year of the School of Law. 
when Robert E. Lee assumed the presidency of Washington College in 1865, he was quite aware that healing the nation's wounds posed challenges unlike any that had come before and required an education unlike what existed at that time. Knowledge for its own sake, the cultivation of the mind, remained a virtuous aspiration, but we should also pursue the cultivation of humanity. The legacy of Lee's presidency is a recognition that to change the world, leaders needed analytical and practical knowledge, along with the capacity for ethical reasoning. Not only should they have the ability to seek justice, they also needed a deep understanding of the requirements of justice and the moral fortitude to commit to a cause greater than the self. And so Judge Brockenbrough's Lexington School of Law became part of Washington College and has since grown into national prominence. It has produced graduates known for professionalism and competence, for understanding the intricate details of the law, as well as the deepest ethical responsibilities it imposes upon them. As we congratulate you, we charge you with fulfilling your duties. We know that you will meet them and exceed the very high standards of those who came before you. We wish you the very best. This has been an interesting year at the School of Law. Indeed, during your three years across the ravine, you have been part of a growing conversation on the nature of legal education. And you have been part of a transformation that has captured the attention and the imagination of the legal world well beyond Lexington. Dean Rod Smola, along with your faculty, has led that effort and asked all of us to confront the exciting, if somewhat intimidating, challenge of revitalizing law school curricula here and across the country. We are glad that Dean Smola is here. And with gratitude, I now recognize him, Rod Smola, Dean of the School of Law. Thank you, President Ruscio. I send you welcome on behalf of my colleagues on the Faculty of Law who are seated here in the front, to the left and right of the graduates, and our provost, June Aprilli, who is seated on the platform with us. Let me extend to all of our guests, to all of the family members, loved ones, and friends of the graduates, our deepest expression of thanks on behalf of these fine students for all the support and encouragement and love that you have extended to them over this weekend, over the past three years, and throughout their lives. They wear their robes and carry their walking sticks as external symbolic garb. But inside them, they carry a part of you, for they could not have done it without you, and their triumph today and celebration is also yours. To you, our graduates, I invite you to think of this. As you leave this place, reflect, as President Ruscio has suggested, on why you came to this place. You were brought here to grow, but not grow into being something. You were brought here to grow into being someone. And for you, and for all of us, that growing continues throughout our entire lives. We send you out into this great profession, this magnificent calling this vocation with pride and with confidence. There is now a part of us, a part of this place that will always be with you. The knowledge and skills that you've acquired, but far more importantly, the great values and traditions of our profession that you have absorbed will always be for you not just a slogan or nostalgia, 
but a core element of what you are and for what we stand for. The practice of law in the highest and greatest traditions, in a spirit of public service, with a deep sense of civility, humility, respect for human dignity, and the eternal, never-ending quest for justice. I now ask the members of the class of 2009 to stand. Mr. President, I have the honor to present five candidates for the Master of Laws degree and 138 candidates for the Juris Doctor degree. They have been examined by the faculty and approved by the Board of Trustees. They are to be congratulated on their command of the ways by which justice is attained and commended for their exceptional learning to the advancement of a just social order. I ask you by your official act to confer upon them their degrees. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and approval by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer the degrees of Masters of Law and Juris Doctor of Washington and Lee University. Please come forward to receive the diploma as your name is called, and I ask that the audience please hold its applause until the last graduate has received his or her diploma. I will first present our candidates for the LLM degree, Yingwei Chen. Peggy Feibig, Ron G, Constantine Kareva Minkenya, Elizabeth Wambui, and Yaguna. I will now present the candidates for the Juris Doctor degree. Nicholas Vincent Albu. Clifford Joseph Ashcroft Smith. George Calvin Awkward III. Austin Duff Baston. Virginia Ann Bell. Kathleen Shea Blazak. Brian Mark Bleck. Nicole Christian Bright. Jessica Lauren Burke. Patrick Nicholas Caldwell. Jonas Aaron Callis. Joseph Stephen Camden. Matthew Stewart Cathy.
Sapita Chachi Kunsare. Michael James Giusano. Travis Gran Cushman. Want me to slow down and do that? Okay. Will that do it now? Megan Moses Deal. I'll wait one more. Ryan Matthew Decker. Catherine DeForest. Vincent Anthony Donguera. Crystal Lee Doyle. Jane Jino Du. Michael P. Duffy. Andrea Emerson Dunawilla. Johnny Roseanne Els. Daniel Hackett Ennis. Evelyn Espinoza. Michelle Lynn Evans. Barrett Louise Everhart. Jason Philip Fancher. Lee Ann Faugust. Courtney Clark Fisher. Eric William Flynn. Rachel Mariner Flynn. Michael Thomas Freeman. Michael Philip Gaffney. Christopher Bo Galloway. Charles Edward Gates, Jr.
Bartholomew John Gengler. Charles Ryan, Germany. Timothy Ray Gilbert. Song Hee Han. Catherine Ann Hall. John Amos Harter. Alexis Sullivan Hawley. Samuel Joseph Hawley. Christopher William Henry. Bradley Robert Henson. Sarah Allison Perkins Hess. Catherine Elizabeth Howren. Nathan Eugene Hoyle. David Paul Hupka. Jonathan Dale Hughes. Kristen Ann Hutchins. Andrew Pearsall Hines. Spencer Raymond Jarvis. Kara Lang Jones. Christine Noel Kidwell. David Christopher Keebler. Erica Ray Shamblin Knott. Stella Sukyong Ko. Jeffrey N. Creation. Russell Nicholas Cruz. Christopher Andrew Lauderman. Noah Clark Laricella.
Ashley Elizabeth Lawson. Eric Brock Lawson. Garrett Shea Ledgerwood. Daniel Lee. Jennifer W. Lynn. Todd Harper Lindsay. Angela Francis Littlejohn. Yu Leo. Robert Edgar Logue. Michael James Lombardino. Kate Meredith Loudenslagel. Peter S. Massaro III. Michael Thomas McCarthy. Thomas Hayden McElroy. Daniel Patrick McNamara. Francis DeSales McWilliams IV. Roger Herbert McSad. Abigail Adams Moffat. Peter Reddick Montefusco. Andrew Howard Morton. Alan C. Myers. Karthik Nagarajan. Jessica Elaine Nelson. Blaine Bennington Nicholson. Arif Shamsharali Narani. Oleg V. Noodleman.
Ketan Vinod Kumar Patel. Elizabeth Ann Plakta. Christopher Sean Potter. Allie Matthews Rather. Simran Rahi Nanish Ramji. Jesse McLaughlin Rappole. Robert Carter Thompson Reed. In absentia, Virginia Helen Rogers. Jonathan Paul Rosamond. Jonathan Keith Ross. Narissa Neal Rouser. Eduardo E. Safil. <laughs> Nicholas Scanavino. Gregory Lawson Schinner. Richard William Slotch. Anthony Michael Segura. Vimi H. Shad. In absentia, Laura Kristen Matney Shapiro. Jordan Kelly Sharps. Sarah Jean Shire. Alan Palmer Smith. Jefferson Davis Smith the fourth. Nathaniel M. Smith. Ryan Hansen Staley. Rebecca D. Stanglin.
Andrew Rob Stewart. Kelly Francis Staler. Laura Elizabeth Strick. Mark Jared Sullivan. Mark Allen Sweeney, Jr. John Ryan Saleos. Bridget Marie Tainer Parkins. Crystal Elizabeth Teed. Sanjay Samuel Thomas. Catherine Ann Trow. Matthew Scott Tyree. Srinkath Vedic Apu Rapu. In absentia, Robert Moir Van Horn. Jeanette S. Way. Andrew Timothy Wendell. Emily Aleph White. Megan Lee Williams. Jonathan Robert Wright. Fong Ye. Elizabeth Sarah Yost. Please be seated. <laughs> Mr. President, I now have the honor to present for the award of the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws, the Right Honorable, the Lord Phillips of Worth Matravers. I will now read the citation approved by the University Board of Trustees. Lord Chief Justice Nicholas Addison Phillips, Baron Phillips of Worth Matravers. You have distinguished yourself as one of the leading judicial voices of our time. As Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, 
You were the highest judicial officer of England and Wales. You have been an historic figure in England's modern constitutional reforms. In October of this year, in your capacity as senior law lord, you will become the first president of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. You read law at King's College at Cambridge University. You have served the legal system and the government of Great Britain in many capacities throughout your extraordinary life in the law. As a member of the Royal Navy, as junior counsel to the Ministry of Defense, as a High Court judge on the Queen's bench, as a Lord Justice of Appeal, as a member of the Privy Council, as Master of the Rolls, as Lord Chief Justice, and now as soon to be the first President of the United Kingdom Supreme Court. Throughout your career, you have been a champion of reasoned reform, respect for human rights, accountability, internationalism, and the rule of law. As law lord, you ruled that the former dictator of Chile, General Augusto Pinochet, should not be granted immunity for extraditable crimes. You have challenged the United Kingdom to address its prison overcrowding crisis and have called for the greater use of community sentences and other programs to enhance the possibility of rehabilitation. You have argued that Great Britain and the other nations of the world, united in the war against terrorism, must not, in their zeal for security, trample the human rights of immigrant populations. In honoring you, Washington and Lee celebrates the shared common law heritage of our two nations, including our shared dedication to such fundamental legal norms as due process of law, as enshrined in the Constitution of the United States and Magna Carta. For having been a champion for approaching legal issues with a global outlook, as a leader in Great Britain's relations with the judicial systems of Europe and the United States, and as a tireless advocate for the rule of law, Washington and Lee University is proud to confer upon you Lord Chief Justice Nicholas Addison Phillips, Baron Phillips of Worth Matravers, the Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Lord Phillips, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I pronounce you Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa of Washington and Lee University, and in token thereof, present you with this diploma. I will now introduce Lord Phillips as our commencement speaker. I'd like to also invite you to extend a word of welcome to Lady Crystal Phillips, his wife, who also traveled from England to be here today. We have been fortunate to have teaching with us at Washington and Lee last year and in the year that is to come, and we hope for the indefinite future, a member of the Supreme Court of Virginia, Justice Donald Lemons, who is here sitting with our faculty today. And I want to thank Justice Lemons and his wife, Carol Lemons, who are here with us today, for helping us to secure the invitation to Lord Phillips and to be the hosts for Lord and Lady Phillips during their weekend with us. Thank you, Justice Lemons, and thank you, Carol. In the year 1946, President Harry Truman introduced Sir Winston Churchill to deliver an address at Westminster. Not Westminster in London, 
but tiny Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. Winston Churchill traveled to Missouri and delivered a speech that would become one of the great speeches of his life. It is known as the Sinews of Peace Address. And I will share with you a few words from Winston Churchill to introduce our speaker. We must never cease to proclaim in fearless tones the great principles of freedom and the rights of man, which are the joint inheritance of the English-speaking world and which through Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, habeas corpus, trial by jury, and the English common law find their most famous expression in the American Declaration of Independence. All this means that the people of any country have the right and should have the power by constitutional action, by free unfettered elections, with secret ballot, to choose or change the character or form of government under which they dwell. The freedom of speech and thought should reign, that courts of justice, independent of the executive, unbiased by any party, should administer laws which have received the broad assent of large majorities or are consecrated by time and custom. Here are the title deeds of freedom which should lie in every cottage home. Here is the message of the British and American peoples to mankind. Let us preach what we practice. Let us practice what we preach. There are few lawyers or jurists in the world who stand as greater exemplars of that spirit of Winston Churchill than Lord Nicholas Phillips. Please join me in welcoming him as this year's commencement speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the class of 2009, it is a great pleasure and honor to be the only one here who has not earned his degree. And so the first thing I want to do is to congratulate all of you who have earned your degrees. I can remember when I was in your position and the feeling of joy and relief at having made it, coupled with apprehension at the thought of going out into the real world and trying to earn a living with the knowledge that I had acquired. And I'd also like at the outset to congratulate your families and friends. It makes it much easier to get a degree if you have the support of those you love. Moral support and I dare say sometimes a bit of financial assistance as well. I've been reading your Dean's account uh, of the year that you've completed. Professional development through simulated and actual practice experience. Well, I've had just about 50 years of practice experience so perhaps I've earned my degree after all. I wonder why you have decided to become lawyers. I suspect that your motives vary widely. Some of you may be motivated by a desire to uphold the rule of law, to help those in society who are deprived to obtain their legal rights, to play your part in meeting the challenges that are facing society today. Others may be motivated by the lifestyle that the successful lawyer can enjoy, Others may think that practicing law is going to be fun. Others of you may not be quite sure what you want to do and may have decided to give law a try and see how you make out. I think I probably fell into the last two categories. Certainly, I regret to say I was not motivated by a burning desire to help society when I was called to the English bar. Indeed, I had no idea what area of the law I wished to practice. Chance played a role. I'd done national service in the Royal Navy and I met a barrister who told me he specialized in admiralty work and invited me to join his chambers. Up to that moment, I hadn't even been aware that admiralty chambers existed. But I started off specializing in shipping law before expanding my practice into other areas of commercial law. I accepted an invitation to go on the bench about 20 years ago, but never regretted making the change. In recent times, as you've heard, I've had the good fortune to hold a series of most interesting judicial offices. And I've come increasingly to realize the vital importance of the rule of law 
and of the role that lawyers play in upholding it. My wife, Christelle, as you might have guessed, is French. So she comes from a country where the legal system is inquisitorial rather than adversarial. Initially, she found it surprising that I numbered among my friends some who did nothing but criminal defense work and who would sometimes be rejoicing at having persuaded a jury to acquit a particularly unattractive client against all the odds. How can they appear for people like that when they know they're guilty, she would ask me. And I would explain to her that it's not for the lawyer to judge his client. The lawyer's duty is fearlessly but fairly to present his client's case in the best possible light. The lawyer on the other side can be relied upon to redress the balance. In this way, both the strengths and weaknesses of the case should be exposed, and the tribunal, be it judge or jury, best placed to make the just decision. Every judge in England takes an oath. It is to do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this realm without fear or favor, affection or ill will. That oath is particularly important in times such as the present, when our world seems under threat, both from terrorism and now from the apparent disintegration of what had seemed to be rock-solid financial institutions. There is a tendency at times of emergency for the executive to think that the safety of society calls for suspension of some parts of our law. Terrorist suspects must be detained without trial in the interest of protecting society from being blown up. The ends of obtaining information necessary to combat terrorism justify questionable means. Bankers who've grown fat on bonuses without protest from any of the millions who are happy to take their share of growth and prosperity that seem designed to go on forever should be stripped of their wealth by retroactive legislation. Citizens, frightened, bewildered, and angry, may well accept the necessity for such measures. But lawyers and judges know better, or should do. We cannot hope to preserve our liberty by depriving others of it. I cannot pretend that my country has a particularly good track record. During the First World War, we passed regulations under which citizens were detained without trial, and we did the same in the Second World War. The Secretary of State was given the power to detain anyone whom he had reasonable cause to believe to be of hostile associations. The Home Secretary, Sir John Anderson, locked up a Mr. Liversidge and refused to give any reason for doing so. The courts held that he was within his rights. Only one judge stood out, Lord Atkin. In his dissent, he said, in this country, amid the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they speak the same language in war as in peace. It has always been one of the pillars of freedom, one of the princi principles of liberty, for which on recent authority we are now fighting, that the judges are no respecters of persons and stand between the subject and any attempted encroachments on his liberty by the executive, alert to see that any coercive action is justified in law. In this case, I have listened to arguments which might have been addressed acceptably to the Court of King's Bench in the time of Charles I. I protest, even if I do it alone, against a strained construction of words with the effect of giving an uncontrolled power of imprisonment to the minister. It will not surprise you that this is the only judgment that is remembered today, not any of the subservient majority. After 9-11, the United Kingdom passed an act that gave the government the power to detain alien terrorist suspects without trial. They could only lawfully do this on the ground that there was a public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Lord Hoffman, one of our most brilliant judges, in a dissent worthy of Lord Atkin, disagreed with his colleagues on whether this test was satisfied. He said, this is a nation that has been tested in adversity which has survived physical destruction and catastrophic loss of life. I do not underestimate the ability of fanatical groups of terrorists to kill and destroy, but they do not threaten the life of the nation. Whether we would survive Hitler hung in the balance, but there is no doubt that we will survive Al-Qaeda. The real threat to the life of the nation in the sense of a people living in accordance with traditional laws and political values 
comes not from terrorism, but from laws such as these. That is the true measure of what terrorism may achieve. It is for Parliament to decide whether to give the terrorists such a victory. While all this was going on, on our side of the Atlantic, your courts were having to wrestle with the problem posed by Guantanamo. We watched with apprehension, but also with confidence, because for us, the United States has always epitomized the rule of law. And I believe that we are seeing our confidence justified. Respect for the rule of law must be the very foundation of our fight against terrorism. Two years ago, with your Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts, I took part in celebrations at Jamestown to mark the 400th anniversary of the arrival of three tiny ships from England, bearing the first European settlers who'd arrived to found the colony of Virginia. Members of my inn of court, the Middle Temple, had been instrumental in mounting this expedition, and quite a number thereafter left England to settle in the new colonies over here. In what we call the American Revolution and what you call the War of Independence, most of these were on your side. Five members of my inn were signatories to the Declaration of Independence, and no less than seven signed the Federal Constitution. In so doing, we gave your country what we have never had, a written constitution and a Supreme Court. And 14 years later, that court was blessed with the appointment as Chief Justice of a man who's always ranked at the forefront of my list of heroes of the world. And I'm speaking, of course, of John Marshall. In the great case of Marbury and Madison, he invented judicial review. And judicial review not merely of the acts of the executive, but of the legislature, for he ruled that the Supreme Court had the power to strike down a statute as unconstitutional. It is this power that gives added meaning to your court's title of Supreme Court. It really is supreme, and its standing around the world, and especially in the United Kingdom, is second to none. When a member of your Supreme Court falls to be appointed, it is world news. My sister-in-law phoned me from France to tell me that David Souter had announced his resignation, and this week the London Times devoted a leader to discussion of his replacement. In Britain, we are about to have a new Supreme Court. I recently presided over the selection of three new members of that court. Their appointments have received no media coverage. This is in part because our new Supreme Court will not be supreme. Let me tell you a little about it, for it's a topic on which I find confusion, not merely abroad, but in our own country. The separation of powers, which was and is a fundamental principle of your constitution, was unknown in Britain at the time your constitution was drafted. Those responsible for making our laws in the form of the House of Lords, our upper house of parliament, also performed the function of a final court of appeal. The house dealt with legislation in the afternoon. In the morning, it transacted its judicial business. It sat to hear appeals to parliament from judges in all parts of the United Kingdom. All members of the house could vote on whether to allow an appeal or not despite the fact that most of them had no legal qualifications or indeed any knowledge of the law at all. At the end of the 19th century, Parliament decided this was not a very good idea and delegated the hearing of appeals to a judicial committee made up of members of the House of Lords who had been specially ennobled from the ranks of the senior judges. These were called the Law Lords and they were and are still technically members of Parliament who could take part in the legislative business of the House. Over time, they ceased to do this so that they simply acted, in effect, as a Supreme Court. Thus, there developed in practice separation of powers between the legislature and the judiciary. But this was not obvious to the man in the street who had no idea who or what the law lords are. Today, there are 12 of us, but the average citizen has no idea what we do and certainly not who we are. The current administration decided to change this and legislated for the creation of a Supreme Court. This is going to open for business on October the 1st in a courthouse which has been specially converted. It stands opposite the Houses of Parliament on the other side of Parliament Square. The 12 law lords will walk across the square and turn into justices of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. The difference between our Supreme Court and yours will be that ours cannot strike down legislation as being unconstitutional. 
This is because under our unwritten constitution, Parliament is supreme. It can pass any law it wants to, and the judges have no choice but to apply it. Well, you'll be glad to hear that's the end of the history lesson. It is customary on an occasion such as this for the speaker to give the new graduates a piece of advice. When I was trained uh, for the bar, we were given a golden rule of cross-examination. Never ask a witness a question unless you know the answer that he is going to give. That made it a little difficult for my opponent on one occasion when I appeared in what is called a scuttling action. My client's elderly ship had sunk in calm weather in the South China Sea, and they'd claimed against their insurers on the basis that it suffered a fatigue crack in the shell plating. The insurers alleged that on the contrary, my clients had sunk their ship on purpose to get the insurance monies by paying the second engineer to open the main sea suction valve. The crew of my client's ship had been rescued by a tug and taken to Hong Kong, and we'd used a private inquiry agent to take a statement of their evidence. I decided that it would be preferable to put these statements in evidence rather than call the crew to give oral evidence when they would be subjected to cross-examination. But I could only read these statements if I could prove that they had been made by the crew. Normally, this would have been admitted. But the insurers, just to be difficult, insisted that I call the inquiry agent all the way from Hong Kong to prove that he'd taken these statements. This did not take very long. You practice as a private inquiry agent in Hong Kong? Uh, yes. Did you take these statements from the crew? Uh, yes, I did. Are you sure that they are accurate? Yes, I am. I sat down. My opponent, David Steele, Queen's Counsel, now the Admiralty Judge, stood up to cross-examine. It was obvious he hadn't got the slightest idea what to ask. Uh, how long uh, have you practiced as a private inquiry agent in Hong Kong? Five years. Well, uh, what did you do before that? I was in the Hong Kong police. Not a very good answer for him. Long silence. Well, well did you go straight from uh, the police to being an inquiry agent? No. Oh, well, what did you do in between? I was in prison. For how long? Four years. What for? Perverting the course of justice. And so I'm not going to advise you not to ask a witness a question unless you know what answer he will give. Instead, I am going to wish all of you every success and happiness in your chosen careers. I'll now invite Calvin Awkward, the president of the class, and Kate Loudenslegel, the vice president of the class, to come to the podium to present a Washington and Lee walking stick to Lord Phillips. Yesterday, when I spoke to the law class at the award ceremony, I told them that the three O's who had a walking stick had a very distinct, uh, it was, they had a distinct honor as uh, members of the Washington League community. These third year members with a walking stick were known to be loyal, most scholarly, and most cavalier. On behalf of the law class of 2009, we want to present this walking stick to Lord Phillips. We see him as a leader in our legal community and someone who's most cavalier, most scholarly, and most loyal. Thank you very much indeed. This is going to come in useful in keeping my colleagues on the new Supreme Court in order. The presentation of that walking stick is also apt because it turns out that Lord Phillips is a great outdoorsman 
Uh, he's a, he loves to hike, and he'll be uh, hiking with one of our law students as his guide on the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains the rest of this weekend. So after using your stick to hike, we hope you can keep the court in order, Lord Phillips. This is not only commencement weekend, but of course it's Mother's Day weekend. And as we celebrate Mother's Day, and as I leave our graduating students with a final thought, I leave it to you on behalf of your mothers and all the others who are here looking down at you with so much love and so much pride. My own son Dylan is here along with my wife Michelle, his mom, and this is a, uh, this is a piece of a song, one of my favorites, some of you have heard me say it to you before, from Bob Dylan. May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you climb a ladder to the skies and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. I'll now invite the president of the university to close the ceremonies. Thank you, Dean Smola. As long as I don't have to sing that, I'll be happy to close the ceremony. I am aware that I am all that stands between you and the, the final celebration, so I will be very brief. We will bring these exercises to a fitting conclusion by expression, expressing our gratitude to all those who have made this day possible. We remember the faculty whose scholarship and commitment to teaching have intellectually prepared you to begin your careers. We remember your families and friends who have sacrificed on your behalf time, labor, and substance over these years of study. Alumni and friends of the university whose continuing generosity has enabled us to support you during your time here, often in ways that you may not have realized. And finally, the staff, the administrators, the custodians, the dining service, and facilities and management employees whose daily and faithful performance of their duties has made your lives more comfortable. On behalf of the class, I thank all of them for making today possible for each of your graduates. As we send you on your way, may I offer you one last word. This is a very powerful life you have chosen with capacity to do so much good, but with real consequences when you do not. Your years at Washington Lee have prepared you in ways that are not readily apparent to you today. During our time here, we come to take for granted the benefits of collegiality and civility, or how trust in others leads us to respect for individuals. We tell the truth as a matter of course. When we face a decision about how to behave, we don't ask first what are the consequences to me? We ask what is appropriate and right. The character of our community develops within us certain characters or certain habits of the heart. That will serve you well in a profession where integrity matters. And if I hear one common refrain from your fellow alumni, it is that Washington and Lee did not just prepare them to be lawyers. It prepared them to be a certain kind of lawyer, one who seeks to fulfill the profession's noblest aspirations. If you forget what those are, I encourage you to remember the example of intellectual excellence and professional integrity set by your teachers and the values of Washington and Lee's honor system. If you do so, you will bring distinction to you and, and honor to yourself and to this institution now and forever, your alma mater, and to the legal profession. Godspeed and good luck, we are adjourned. <laughs>